Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? All good? OK, so I'm Chris. Uh, I'm going to speak to you today about zombies and binary, which is a very interesting talk topic title. But most of it takes place in this game, which is called Minecraft. Uh, recently acquired by Microsoft, I guess this is my first Microsoft tech stack talk. Uh, and at the rate I'm going, probably the last one. But um, it's a pretty fun game. And actually, there is a hidden quality to it that I think is, is pretty awesome. And I'll show you what that is. But before I get too far into it, uh, I'd like to thank Fluent for having me here and actually accepting a talk like this. It's a pretty wacky for our talk for a conference. Uh, but I'm great to have the opportunity to talk about it. And I'm sure you'll agree with me, the conference has been awesome so far. And the talks have been great and the catering. So uh, I'd like to thank Fluent about that. And I'd like to thank my employer, Silverstripe, because they let me come here and give me the time to do this and encourage me to do these weird things. Um, and it's all the way from Wellington, so like it's a great deal of time for them. Anyway, this is Minecraft. It's a game. Uh, you can break stuff, and you can explore, and there's trees, and sometimes deserts, and uh, snowscapes. And um, it's famous for two things, really. Uh, as the name suggests, you can mine in Minecraft using pickaxes that you can construct. Uh, you can find resource nodes like this and break them down and gather the resources up underneath uh, that exist in here. I'm just actually going to change my game mode. <laughs> game mode two. Um, so you can break blocks like this that you find underground, and you can melt them down, and you can make things like gold and silver and all those kinds of things. So mining is the one aspect that makes Minecraft popular. Another is the ability to craft. So here I've got some sheaves of wheat, and I can combine these to make a delicious, tasty bread roll, which I don't actually think I'm hungry enough to eat right now. But if I was, I could eat it. That's the other side of Minecraft, is building stuff, combining ingredients that you find out in the wild or that you get from slaying vicious monsters and building the, combining those things together. Now, it's not all peaceful like this. As I said, there are kinds of monsters. So for instance, there are zombies, and this guy is a particularly nasty variety. Uh, and there are also things, other nasty creatures like creepers. An interesting story about the creeper is that this is a hostile mob in the game, and it was kind of created out of a programming error. So the original developer of this, Marcus Pearson, was busy trying to introduce a hostile mob. But the bug was that due to some programming logic errors, it was completely silent until it got right next to you and exploded. And actually, it was so horrifically successful, he just kept that bug in. And it lives on to this day in the form of the creeper, who's a nasty piece of work. But what interests me really about Minecraft is a thing called redstone. It's a resource that you can find deep underground, much deeper than this little gully here. And you mine it as well. It looks like this. And it drops these interesting things. They look like that. It's called redstone. Um, and it's primarily the resource we're going to be looking at today. But I bet you're asking yourself, or at least I was the first time I was thinking about this talk, what does this have to do with programming? What does redstone and this big old game have to do with programming? So I'll introduce you some, to some beginner JavaScript, which you've undoubtedly seen before. But I want to cover it because it's important. So in this example, I can create a variable called condition and assign it the value of whatever the check function returns. You can imagine that the check function is going to return a Boolean value. Sorry, I'll just make it daytime so it's a bit brighter. You can imagine the check function is going to return a Boolean value, like true or false. And in a condition, we can say, well, if this condition returns true, then run the engage function. Of course, we can combine these, as you probably know, by the double ampersand symbol. So if one is true and the other is true, then we can run this bit of code in the middle. And not only that, if we don't actually want true, but we want the opposite, we can invert those with the exclamation, or not, as it's often referred to. So here, if the condition's not true and we're debugging, say that something's wrong in the console. Now, this is very elementary JavaScript, right? But the interesting thing about Minecraft is that it supports just the right number of primitives to be able to do this in the game, to be able to create Boolean comparisons and binary logic in the game. So let's have a look at what some of those primitives are. This redstone stuff that we picked up, it looks like this when it's placed down. We can place some more down like this. And you can place it, and you can break it. But what's interesting about this is that it is akin to 
the conductive traces on a circuit board. This redstone, when it's placed down, carries a signal. And there are things in Minecraft, like this lever, or switch if you prefer, that emit signals when they're engaged. So we can see the signal traveling all along this conductive trace until it gets to about here and the signal attenuates. Now that attenuation is perhaps not common in programming because a true value is always a true value no matter how many times you read it or write it or transmit it through functions, but in electronics, attenuation is really real. And in Minecraft, to get around this, you can use what's called a repeater. Exactly the same concept as a network repeater that amplifies network signals over long, wide networks, you can use a repeater in Minecraft. So if we put this in series, the signal gets progressively weaker leading up there, but the repeater repeats it at full strength, and this lamp lights up, which is pretty cool. It's not the only interesting thing about repeaters. You can put a few of these, or I'll put a few of them in series to show you something. You can right-click on these and create an artificial delay. So watch what happens when I toggle this lever again. You see the delay that's created there? It's also when you switch off. And that delay is useful because actually when you're programming or doing circuitry in Minecraft, sometimes you actually have to make race conditions to get stuff to work, which is, which is fascinating. Actually enforcing those kinds of things, which we usually try and avoid, it's quite interesting. There's another thing you can craft in the game called a redstone torch. I think if you combine a stick and some redstone, you'll get this. And this is kind of like a switch, except it's always on, except when it's not. When you put these down, they emit a signal. And we can see this going along the redstone trace and illuminating the bulb. However, when you put a signal into a redstone torch, like I'm about to do, it's going to go along this redstone trace, through the block, and the signal's going to go into the redstone torch. And when we do that, the torch turns off. Now, this seems kind of elementary and, and sort of weird if you try and wonder how this can make effective circuitry, but we'll see. We'll see in a bit. Because here I've, oh, hey pig. Here I've mapped out some area for us to experiment with. You see, these components that we've seen, just a few of them, and this idea of sending a charge or a signal over a trace, this helps us to make elementary logic gates. The first one that I want to make is an OR gate. So let me get some redstone out this chest. Now to make an OR gate, what we essentially want to do is that either the switch or the switch should be on. And if either of them are on, we want a signal to go here and to light this lamp up. A very easy way to do this is just to make the trace all the way to the lamp. Kind of like if we connected a wire directly from the power source to the, to the LED, right? and either of them illuminate the lamp. But an interesting thing is happening here because the signal is not only going all the way to the lamp, but it's also arcing back to the rest of the circuit, which maybe we don't want to happen. And so to avoid this, we can actually use redstone repeaters as a diode. That's more on the electronic side. Now, OR gates are probably the simplest kinds of logic gates to build. Let me turn the rain off. That's kind of annoying. Go away. We can also build AND gates, and these are slightly more complex, but infinitely more useful than just a normal OR gate. To do that, we expect that toggling both of these will mean that that lamp goes on, because there'll be a charge flowing into it. And so to get that working, we have to do kind of a strange configuration. Ooh, I need redstone torches. We have to do kind of a strange configuration of redstone torches and redstone. You see what's happening here? is that I have these two redstone torches at the top, and they don't seem to be switching each other off. However, because there's a charge there, this redstone torch is switching off. That's where that dynamic of redstone torches switching on and off comes into effect. Because we can switch either of these off by sending a signal into them. But only when both of them are off does the signal go off, and this redstone torch goes on. And so this is an AND gate. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's not the most compact one that you can build or the most complex one you can build in Minecraft. People have gone nuts and built like really small versions of this. And the other logic gates based on the concepts I've expressed here. 
But this, for me, was a really easy way to understand how this was working. That's the one aspect of making circuitry and programming in Minecraft. The other is this idea of trying to create basic variables. Now, Minecraft has a coordinate system. You can engage it, and it looks like this, and it's quite, kind of ugly and full of numbers. But check out these numbers over here on the left-hand side. There's an X, a Y, and a Z, or Z, depending on where you're from in the world. And these indicate where the player is standing. But they also indicate where it is possible to place blocks. And there's a special kind of block that you can use to execute commands, just as if you were SSHing into the server running Minecraft and running these on some console. And it is the set block command. So if we call set block and we give it the x, y, and z coordinates and tell it what block we want to spawn, then when we press this button that gives the command block a signal, it executes that command and places a block. I've done something similar here. You'll notice these coordinates are the same one as the command block that sets the redstone block. However, they summon a block of air, which is essentially saying, remove whatever block is there. And this is a kind of variable storage, if you think about it. That coordinate system can be treated like an address in memory. And we're just storing something in that address in memory. In this case, it's a type of block called a redstone block, which also gives off a permanent signal, but won't be turned off like redstone torches are. And we can set the address in memory to the contents of that block. And we can remove it, which is a kind of variable storage. Now, just like we can set it and we can remove it, we kind of need some way to read what's there, right? It's no good placing things if we can't tell if they're there or not. And so to do that, we use a complementary command, Ooh, let me turn that off, called test for block. Again, the same coordinates and checking for a redstone block. And if we just push this button to give the command block a signal, it's not going to detect the redstone block because it's not there. But if we put it there and then we run the test for block, this gets a signal and this lights up. And it's able to do that because we have a component here called a comparator, which actually is kind of complex and I never use it except for this express purpose of testing for blocks. And when this tests for a block and sees it, it gives the comparator a signal, and then the comparator can light up this LED. That's kind of cool. Here I have an example of a clock. You see, again, I'm setting a block in this top command block, and here I'm setting an air block in the bottom one. And they're both targeting this area here. But because of how the timing in Minecraft works, the top one gets a signal the moment you destroy this. So let me put game mode back to one. You see what's happening there? The top command block is summoning this block. The bottom one's removing it. And the top one gets a signal immediately at that point and summons it again. And this that I'm doing with the mouse is actually happening at a much faster rate. That is happening so quickly, we can't, the game's not rendering it the same as when we click. But it's doing this permanently. And I've set this command block up to test for the presence of any one in the radius of four blocks around it. So when I move four blocks out, it's going off. When I move four blocks in, it's going on. And the reason I don't need to push this button is because the clock is permanently removing and placing a signal emitting block here, which is giving this power to keep on checking. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times a second, which is what makes it possible to do this. So we've got the concept of Boolean comparison, right, in our AND gates and our OR gates. And here we have the concept of variable assignment. And I'm just treating it like Boolean variable assignment, but we've got addresses in memory that we can store different blocks to. And we can test for any number of blocks that Minecraft supports. So actually, we don't just need to test for the presence of a block. We can test for the presence of a specific kind of block. So we've got Boolean comparisons. We've got variable assignment. And that lets us build some interesting things. Now here, I've mapped out a nice little pattern to remind me of what I actually need to do. But just in the session, I want to build a simple counter. I'll make it day again so that it's nice and bright. I want to build a simple counter. I want to have some kind of switch here that I can engage. And the first time I press it, I want that bulb to light up. The second time I press it, I want that bulb to light up. And the third time, I want that bulb to light up. It's a simple counter circuit. To do this, we can use the same components we've seen before, and one or two new ones. Let me put all the stuff away. Yay. Yay for clean inventory. Oh, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> There we go. Okay. These are all the things I need, I think. 
So the kind of switch I want to do is a pressure plate. And I'll just map out some conductive trace down here and give it a signal. You see it light up when I step on it? That's the kind of button I'm going to use. And all three of these branches of logic are going to get the same signal at the same time, which turns out is actually kind of problematic for us. So what I want to rather do is engage a little bit of a delay. What's going to happen, though it's probably too quick to see, no, it's not that quick to see, is that the third branch is going to get a signal way before the second and the first one do. And I'll explain why that is in a little bit, but it's important to do that, just for this kind of circuit. Now, the first count's kind of easy, right? Every time I press the button, it's possible to count one. I don't need to do any checking to see if it's already counted or not. I don't need to do any resetting. All I need to do is have a command block that spawns a redstone block right here, and then feed that signal into the first lamp. I've written the coordinates down here, hopefully to remind me what they are. So we can just do set block minus 5286316167. And we want to set a redstone block. Let's test this out and see if it works. There we go. OK, so the command block is creating this redstone block here, which is emitting a charge, which is lighting up this bulb. And it doesn't matter how many times we push this, one is always going to have been counted. But how do we get two to count? How do we make it only count to two after it's counted to one? Well, we can use the same test for block we saw before. I'm just going to put command blocks down on all these, red, uh, all these brown blocks of wool. And to get it to count to two, what I want to do is I want to see, OK, let this command block check if this redstone block is already here. And if it is, it knows it's counted to one already, and it can count to two. So we can do the test for block here. And then we can have a comparator here. So that when this test for block returns a truthy value, if you want to think about it like that, and emits a signal into here, this command block can spawn the count of two and feed that signal into the LED lamp. So let's do set block. Now, coordinates in Minecraft, uh, specifically these things where you set block and you test for block, are kind of the most grunt work that you have to do. And to do them, to get those coordinates, you actually have to open this debug console and see what those coordinates are. You know, stand on the block where you want it to spawn and take note of the coordinates and then make sure that it's placed there. That's probably the most laborious part of this, right? You don't need to do that for the logic gates. You do need to do that when you're setting, essentially, variables in memory, like we are when we're placing blocks. But that kind of makes sense. We have to do that when, or at least programming languages and machine code do that at a lower level. We just never see that kind of stuff ourselves. So let's try this out. It's counted to one. It's counted to two. That's pretty cool. Let's quickly do these last two. So let me move a little bit back. Test for block. And put a comparator down here, again, because we want to power this command block to spawn a new one. And feed a signal into that lamp. Let's count again. One, two, three. So we've built a simple counter in Minecraft. And this illustrates a couple things. Firstly, the reason we needed this delay. If we set these all to the same amount of time, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, I know what's going to happen. It's going to break everything. But how do you think it's going to break everything? It's a race condition. It's a race condition. Two never counts, because this check is done at exactly the same time as this is done. And so they happen at the same time. But this branch of it depends on this one being complete. That's why we add the delay. So now I have to break things. And I think this has actually totally broken it so much that I have to destroy this command block in order to fix it. But that's why we add the delay. It's to make all of these things run in the correct sequence. <laughs> this is totally broken now. One, two, OK, it's not that broken. 
3. That's why we add the race condition. The second thing that this illustrates is that programming with n in mind in Minecraft is actually kind of difficult. Minecraft doesn't do n times operations very well. It basically means that these circuits grow massively. They just expand out into the distance. And that creates problems of its own, but it essentially means that the kinds of program that, programming that Minecraft is for, well, you need to think very long and hard about how they're implemented. But why is this valuable to us? Why does it matter that we can do these things in Minecraft? What good is it that we can make simple circuits and even build them out to be massive sprawling circuits to do more complex things? Because it's still just a game, right? Well, I think the fact that it's a game is what's really important about this, what's really interesting about this to me. Because just about the only reason I still open up Minecraft is to do this kind of stuff. And the reason it excites me to do this kind of stuff is because most of the people I know that play Minecraft are really young. The older people who are playing games are playing like more advanced games and games that they consider to be more of a challenge. Kids play this a lot and it's a lot of fun for them. And they enjoy it because they can express creativity in building immense things and fighting off simplistic mobs and just accruing a whole bunch of digital nonsense on a hard drive. And that's interesting to me because they're already in an environment that has these kinds of primitives that we can use to develop circuitry and programming. They're playing a game that to them is fascinating not because of the weird things you can do to make circuits, but because to them it's still fun. And they might not be technically inclined or trained to use programming languages or thinking in terms of Boolean operations and setting addresses and memory. But if we come alongside them and we show them that these things are possible, and then we start to excite them, not just kids, but people not perhaps technically inclined or trained in professional programming, come along them and explain how these things work and get them to start thinking about this. It is an unwitting, hidden training tool for those people something that they can really enjoy, really get hold of, and learn through without necessarily being dumped in an IDE and given some screencasts to watch. This can be really fun on its own. And added to that, the kind of creativity that you need to do programming in Minecraft can make this even more fun for them. This is a training tool for young and old, people who perhaps don't know much about programming, perhaps don't know much about electronics, and want to bridge all of these things together. And people have done some really wicked and interesting stuff with this. Um, probably the most complex thing I've built in Minecraft uh, is the game of battleships, I guess you could describe it as. I actually built it like that, but on reflection, it's probably not very much like traditional battleships, probably more like a guessing game where two players are in boats and they can see each other in the distance and there's just water between them and they can't actually jump out the boats because of some hidden walls I've put up. But each player's boat has kind of a high wall around it. And on the floor, there are buttons that they can select. So when the game starts, the first player is in his boat and he picks three buttons that the other player can't see. And then immediately, once he's picked those three buttons, the other player gets to guess, gets some buttons on the floor in exactly the same position, and then she could say, well, I think you've picked this top left one and this middle one and this bottom right one. And depending on whether the guesses are correct or incorrect, I mean, if they're incorrect, there are just huge explosions and it's actually quite fun and theatrical. But if they're correct, then the second player wins. And the moment the second player wins or loses, those players swap positions. So the person who previously hid guesses gets to pick, and the person who previously picked gets to hide guesses. It's actually pretty fun. And it's built on a lot of the things that I've shown you. For instance, it's got two or three of these counter circuits because the game's got to know when someone's picked three options or not. And the game's got to know when someone has guessed three options and in order to be able to reset the board. There are things like and comparisons for, when, uh, for comparing each person's guess. So to know whether someone's actually picked a valid thing or not, you have to do an and of both options. There's a lot of interesting, interesting circuitry on it, and compared to what other people have done, it's actually not really complex. I saw a map that someone had made where they basically created an emulator of the Commodore 64, called it Commodore 32, probably to avoid serious litigation. But what they did was they created a CPU using the logic gates and placing and reading blocks. 
And they created a GPU which powered a 32 by 32 pixel, 16 color screen. Because essentially when you, in Minecraft, you have all of these colors of wool. So basically it places and reads these blocks of wool to create a graphics display. Not only did this guy make a working computer in a Minecraft map, he made a Java-based IDE with a high-level language that you could use to program this map. And if you had the map and the IDE open at the same time, you could write a program and transfer your programming code into the memory registers of the running map, restart the computer, and run the program on the map. The map ships with Snake Game, it ships with a Turtle Graphics Painting Game, and it's really a fascinating piece of work. You can explore all the internals of how this thing runs, and it's, it's slow and sprawling, which is why I'm not showing it to you now. But it highlights the kinds of really interesting and complex machinery people can build. And people have built really interesting and complex machinery, aside from the creative buildings and landscapes you can do in Minecraft, which fascinate people who don't care about any of this technical stuff. You can do really complex machinery, which could excite those people to learn it themselves. So that's why I like Minecraft. Um, and I'd highly recommend you try it out. It's actually not that an expensive game to play. I think there are web versions you can try and just experiment with getting into the game if you feel like it. But if you have kids and you want to teach them to program, or students that you interact with frequently, or even, I don't know, people in your family who aren't programmers but would like to get a taste of what it's like, this is actually a really good option for you to sit beside them and walk them through. Um, that's all I got for you. Are there any questions about this stuff, about programming in Minecraft? Yes? That's a very good question. So the question I'll just repeat, um, is there a way to program modules and stuff for this that's not in the game, but aside, next to the game, you can create modules and, and load them in? There is, there is. And a lot of people use that as a basis for training kids predominantly in how to program. So they'll load the game up, and then they'll come alongside the kids and help them to create mods for it, and then restart the game with those mods, and they affect how the game looks or plays, add items to it, and that kind of thing. And that's a very interesting way for kids to learn as well, but it's a slightly a step away from this because it immediately puts them in an IDE, takes them out of a familiar environment and puts them in that. And that's not bad, but it's not the only way to learn. I think, uh, I think this is an interesting way to learn as well, as an alternative to that. Um, this version of the client, I'm actually running a modified version of Minecraft uh, using a mod pack, which is just a collection of those kinds of mods. For one very specific reason, it's to get these high-res slide images in the game. But other than that, all of this stuff works in Minecraft without any modification. Hopefully that answers your question. OK, cool. Any other questions? Yes? I'm not sure I understand what the comparator block is doing. So I don't fully understand it either. It's kind of a weird block. And in fact, uh, I'll just repeat the question as well. Like, what all is the comparator block doing? Is that is that it? Um, it has many uses. It has many uses. And some of them involve placing a few comparator blocks in differing angles and then depending on their frequency, because you can also toggle them a bit, you know, doing kinds of comparison operations with that. But the only thing that I use it for and the only thing I understand very well is if you put this next to a command block and the command block tests for the presence of anything, this will get an input signal. So that's probably the only reason that I use it, that is the only reason I use it, is to test for those things, to test for blocks at addresses in memory or coordinates on the map, if you want to talk about it traditionally. But it's actually, it's a complex block with weird rules. And a lot of this stuff in Minecraft didn't actually start to enable circuitry and, and the kind of basic programming we've seen. It actually just started to be like power sources for lamps to light up your house in the game. And people much smarter than me very long time ago, realized that these things could be used for programming in circuits. And that's where this whole thing has developed from. Nowadays, they add features for this kind of thing. But this was added long before those features were even in mind. This was added before people wanted to program in Minecraft. Are there any other questions? Yes. What are some good resources for learning 
Um, I wrote a series on it, uh, introducing the concepts that I've shown here. You can actually find that. I'll open it up. Wow, what a messy desktop. <laughs> if you go to medium.com forward slash zombies dash binary. I'll put a link to this in the O'Reilly speaker feedback page. Which, by the way, I'd love it if you could give me feedback and tell me what I did wrong so I can be better next time. But this has been kind of slow. OK, so that address, you can go there and there's actually a series of uh, a series of posts which start to explain these concepts and, um, and give useful commands and tips and stuff. And if you're struggling with any of this stuff, by all means, um, by all means chat to me on Twitter and I'll help because I love talking about this stuff. I can waffle about it for hours, but, uh, but we're almost out of time. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for being here.